Our Father, we are gathered here before you today. We want to know your mind. We want you to teach us and direct us. We want you to look into our lives and present to us what you know we need for the hour. And we want you to guide us with your own searching eyes. Lead us in our way so that all we do will be to the glory of your name. Teach us from what we read this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We want to continue our study of the Acts of the Apostles. Already we have seen how the power of God came to the early church on the day of Pentecost. And we have seen how the Holy Ghost transformed coward, fearful apostles and disciples into men of supernatural boldness. And he first started declaring the word of God in Jerusalem as the power came upon them. Because the power of the Holy Ghost is the power of utterance. And as they marched along in obedience to what the Holy Ghost started to do in the early church, it shook their communities. Many people turned to the Lord. And Jerusalem and the environs heard the sound of the gospel truth. Many came to the Lord. Eventually, as the gospel spread, we have learned of the conversion of people in Samaria. And we have also learned of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Now we come to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10. Chapter 10 is a remarkable term, an introduction of a new dimension in the spread of the gospel truth and in the accomplishment of the Great Commission. The word of God started to be preached and proclaimed in a powerful way in Jerusalem. Then as the persecution arose, many of the disciples were scattered abroad. But then, as we learn from the other parts of the Acts of the Apostles, they reached only the Jews. Eventually, the Spirit of the Lord led as Philip found himself in Samaria, and Samaria accepted the truth of the gospel. The Samaritans were not Jewish completely, but then they were not also Gentiles completely. They were a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. They had intermarried with uh, the people that were not Jews. So actually, the Jews despised them. But as the power of God was manifested, Peter and John were sent from the church in Jerusalem. And the minister to them with the laying on of hands, they received the Holy Ghost. And um, as we come to chapter 10, it's actually now the Lord working it out that the fullness of the Great Commission will be experienced. That is, all the details will be carried out. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, Jesus had said he shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now we come to that section where people who are related to the uttermost part of the earth, the Gentiles. And um, as we read the account, actually there is much in the account. But children of God who ought to study the Bible, who ought to be Bible students, you will need to go over the passage because I can only just almost scratch the surface for you. Now, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10. Let's read from verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw a vision in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God 
coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa, and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with one Simon Etana, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. Let's stop there. Whenever you come before the Lord and you study the scriptures, you must be asking, saying, Lord, Master, speak to me, because thy servant heareth. And it doesn't actually matter wherever you are studying. There is so much that the Lord has put in there. Here we read of a man called Cornelius, a soldier. Not only a soldier, an officer. Not an officer of ordinary rank, an officer of a remarkable rank and figure. He was of the Italian band. When you talk of Italy, you talk of Rome. When you talked of Rome at that time, you talked of the Roman Empire. When you talked of the Roman Empire, you talked of the people that were governing at the time. And it was called the centurion of an Italian band because all the soldiers under him were Italians. And that means they were Romans. And it means that he had such a great figure. But then the man was both good and great. Many times you'll find some people who are good, but they are not great. At other times you'll find people who are great, but they are not good. And when you find a combination of greatness and goodness in a single man, it's a wonderful thing. Because the greatness lends authority and weight to the goodness. If a man is great and is not good, his greatness will be used in wicked ways, vicious ways, bad ways. But then when he's great, the goodness and his greatness would lend, you know, some love and some fellowship and some um, help to the greatness. He'll be able to use that in, the good, in a good direction. And so this Cornelius was both great and good. Not only that, you find that um, generally soldiers are not given to being religious or observing hours of prayer. Because they deal with what they can see, they deal with force. But here was a man, an officer, that uh, knew about the Roman Empire and was even sharing as part of the authority in the Roman Empire. But you know, he was a devout man. And he observed regular hours of prayer. How wonderful when men who are great and good are also prayerful. When we do not think that we have attained greatness by our own power, by our own intelligence, and therefore we can jolly well do without the God of heaven. This was a great man who knew that greatness does not stop on the ceiling of the high tower of the skyscraper that you have built. But it goes far beyond that. There is a God in heaven beyond the ceiling of your skyscraper who is to be reckoned with and this great good man knew that you ought to pray to that God how wonderful when men who are rich talented, gifted, educated holding positions of high rank in society would also remember that God is higher than the highest officer and that whatever we are, whoever we are we remember that God of heaven and we pray to that God. This was not a man that only had private praying, ashamed to pray with his own household. You see in verse 2 it says, a devout man, one that feared God with all his house. Have you noticed how children of great men who have a great rank in society, 
Don't feel that there is anything to eat when you call them to pray. Because their earthly father can supply according to them all their needs. They don't have a need of an heavenly father. But here was a man who brought all his household to fear God. And he gave much arms to the people. Considering that it is the Lord that has promoted him. And for the people that are less fortunate on the face of the earth, he was going to do as much as he could do to make life convenient for them. And we're told he prayed to God always. Do you find great men, very common in the world, praying to the only true God? Don't we find them surrounding themselves with idols, with the securities of juju power? Would the securities coming from the wrong direction, from the powers of darkness? Here was a man who felt that the God of heaven was enough security for him. And he felt that the God of heaven had enough power to be able to protect his life. And he did not feel that idols will be the thing to serve. Now, as he was going on in his daily devotion, now look at this. There is no record that he had ever heard the voice of God audibly. There is no record that he had ever seen an angel before this time. But even though there was uh, no voice from heaven, no thunder from the sky, and there was no vision in the prayer room, yet he continued to pray regularly. And he continued to do all that he knew, the best he knew that he could in the direction of God. But to, uh, this time in the study we have today, he had a visitation of a ministering spirit. The Bible calls angels ministering spirits. If you look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 and verse 14. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Those angelic spirits, messengers from heaven, the ministers sent by God to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. The study of angels in the Bible is a great study. And the Bible talks of uh, various types of angels. Angels of different authority, of different power, of different mission. Angels, um, guardian angels for children. Because Jesus said, for, let, let the children come unto me. Because the angels behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. The guardian angels. There are angels that surround the children of God. The angel of the Lord encompasses around them that fear the Lord always as the mountains surround Jerusalem. And you know, when Peter was knocking at the door after he had been delivered by an angel from the prison and the uh, believers within the doors refused to open and Rhoda was saying, oh yes, I know his voice, that is Peter. Oh, they said, it must have been his angel. Those early believers, they knew that angels were ministering spirits and they're always sent forth. Whether you see them or not, they're always there. Sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. And here Cornelius received a visitation from one of such angels. Let's see verse 3 of Acts chapter 10. And he saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, do you know there is a record about you in heaven? And the heavenly record reveals what your name is, what your life is all about, what you are doing secretly and privately. The angel came, and without any introduction at all, because there is a full record about each individual up in heaven, the angel just said, Cornelius. And then when he looked on him, he was afraid. He had never seen an angel before. What would you do if you're having your quiet time in the morning, and all of a sudden you heard your name? And then you opened your eyes, and you saw this angel with six wings, two covering the face. 
and two uh, covering the feet and with the other two just flying within your room wouldn't you shout and also run out of the room that's what Cornelius did he didn't run out he didn't shout but he was afraid and he said what is it Lord what's the matter what's the trouble any problem you know even a soldier can be afraid when heaven's power confronts earthly power this great and good and prayerful man when he saw the angel and he saw that this is from another world he saw that this is from uh, the very presence of God he said what is it Lord and he said unto him thy prayers and thine answer come up for a memorial before God sister brother keep on praying whether you see an angel or not keep on praying because you don't know that those prayers they come up as a memorial before God I pray but then I don't see any revelation keep on praying I pray and there doesn't seem to be an answer keep on praying I pray but it appears that the more I pray the more problems that these people of the world are bringing upon me come keep on praying thy prayers are come up for a memorial before God and thine arms you do good you serve other people and yet the more you help other people the more you give them things the more it appears that they even go against you and they oppose you and it doesn't seem they make life easier for you keep on doing it because it comes up as a memorial before God it is to your record that you are doing those things that are commanded by God and so the angel said the Lord has been noticing that even though you are a soldier you are a different person you are nice you are good you are prayerful and that has come up as a memorial before God because you distinguish yourself you're a different person now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon whose surname is Peter now you see this man was not linked up with the church in Jerusalem the church approved by God the church established by Christ the church commissioned to circle the whole world with the gospel truth he was prayerful he didn't even know Peter he didn't know anybody of the church in Jerusalem and there was no link at all but you know he loved the Lord the best he knew he prayed as much as he knew I'm sure you have met some people before who do not know the whole truth of the Word of God but they know a little they pray their lives are changed they're different they're good maybe maybe they have even seen the vision of an angel before but then some of these uh, good people prayerful people they say well I don't need to belong to any church after all before I even heard about that church I was very very prayerful before I ever heard about any church at all I've been giving arms to the poor before I knew any church at all I had been seeing visions even of angels you know God has just one church I don't mean one local assembly just one true church and he says other sheep I have in other places them I must bring also and so you see the Lord here was working it out that right now this a man Cornelius will now be brought in contact with the church at Jerusalem don't be an isolated Christian no matter how much you can pray don't be an isolated Christian no matter how good you are sanctified and holy seeing the visions of the Lord don't be isolated forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is because there is something the Lord has preserved in the body in the whole body that is meant for every one of us and so he told him sent sent men to Joppa call for one Simon whose surname is Peter he lodges with one Simon a tanner whose house is by the seaside he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do now let me talk to you a little on the word of knowledge the word of knowledge is um, as you can see the impartation of knowledge now this knowledge 
is not always heavenly knowledge. It may be knowledge about earthly things. Now you see here the information that the angel was given related to earthly things. Simon in Joppa. Joppa is city in the world, very near there, just some miles away. And um, Peter, a human being, the tanner, a person having promo uh, profession, all those things are earthly. And you see all that information, another person could get those informations without the angel. If he happened to be living in Joppa, somebody else could tell him if he knew where Joppa was, where Simon was, where Peter was, and if he knew the profession of the person accommodating uh, Peter, you could have all that knowledge in a normal way. But Cornelius had no way of having that knowledge. But now the angel revealed it to him. Because the avenue, the channel through which that knowledge is coming is uh, from God. That's why you call it a word of knowledge. Now think about it. When Elisha informed the king in Samaria, that the king of Syria was waging war against him and this is where he was hiding. You could have that knowledge by sending spies there. You could have that knowledge by sending security men there, finding out the information. It was norm a normal thing that they could have from an earthly source but because the knowledge was coming from above to the prophet of God, that's why it becomes a word of knowledge. When Saul's father had lost the assets, and Saul was seeking for the asses. Now, any other person that found where the asses were could have, could have met Saul on the way and could have told him that, do you know the asses of your father they are found? It is knowledge about asses, about earthly things. But because Samuel got that knowledge from God and gave it to Saul, it became the word of knowledge. And you know, when um, people came to the Lord Jesus Christ, they came to tempt him. And they said, do we pay tribute to Caesar or not? Now, nobody told him they were tempting him. But the people who, were, who made all the conspiracy behind him, they knew that uh, they came to tempt him. If any of those people had come to tell Jesus, now these people are tempting you, that will be knowledge you get in an earthly way about earthly things, about tribute, about Caesar. But because Jesus got it directly from the Father and he said, why tempt ye me? It became word of knowledge. When Gehazi ran after Naaman and said, well, my master now has just got some visitors and he wants you to give two changes of raiment and he wants you to give this and that. Anybody could have seen Gehazi and could have gone to report to Elisha if the report was made like that, that would be common knowledge about earthly things, about changes of raiment, about food, about uh, money, about Naaman, about Gehazi. Ordinary knowledge. But because Elisha got it from above, it became the word of knowledge. Now when you are sick and you go to the hospital and the doctor tests you, or there is an x-ray and uh, the doctor says, this is what is wrong, that's knowledge. But knowledge in an earthly way, by testing you. But when you come for Miracle Revival Hour and the minister of God without an x-ray, without a microscope, without uh, any medical instrument, he mentions the problem, that's a word of knowledge. It's about earthly things, oh yes, concerning earthly people. But that knowledge coming above, coming from above, from God. That's what makes it a word of knowledge. Now, look at it here. The angel revealed to Cornelius and he revealed that Peter whom he had never met was in Joppa and he revealed that the first name that's in verse 5 the first name of Peter was Simon he revealed where uh, Peter was living at that time he lodges with one Simon then he revealed the profession of Simon a tanner and then he even described where the house was by the seaside and then he said you send men to him he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do that's the word of knowledge the word of knowledge is not always given by an angel you'll see it as we read further because Peter here also had word of knowledge but not from an angel there are very very many avenues well that shouldn't surprise you we human beings get our knowledge even ordinarily we get some knowledge by taste. 
We get some knowledge by hearing. We get some knowledge by just seeing. We get some knowledge by what we call intuition. We just know it. We get some knowledge by touch. And it's the same way when God wants to pass across some knowledge to you in the world of knowledge, he has various channels and avenues whereby he passes that knowledge unto you. Now, the angel did not preach the full gospel to Cornelius. You see that? The angels know the limit of their ministry. But he told uh, this man Cornelius, saying to Joppa, Have you ever found some people who pray and fast? And they say, well, I don't need to read Bible. I don't need to go to Bible study. I don't need to read any book that a human being has written. God talks to me personally. All the knowledge I want, I will get from angels. And when you talk to them about sanctification, oh, they say, well, I don't believe it because if that sanctification is true, the angel I saw last week will have taught me. The angel will not teach you sanctification. The angel will send you to Monday Bible study. You know, other people will say, oh, I don't believe restitution because I pray. And all the knowledge of the things of God I have, I always get on my knees when I pray. Because the Lord talks to me. When I was going to get married, God spoke to me. When I was going to do business, God spoke to me. When I was going to join that church, God spoke to me. And so, if this restitution is a true doctrine, God will speak to me when I pray. Oh no, the angel said, send men to Joppa. And then he says, he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. The angel is not an apostle, neither is he a prophet, neither is he an evangelist, neither is he a teacher, nor your pastor. And there is a place the angel cannot hold in your life. And so many people who do not understand, they just miss the point. And they say, well, because I am so spiritual, I will learn everything on my own, endeavoring to remain isolated. Now, we have seen the visitation of the Spirit. Let's see the virtue in the seeker. Cornelius was a sincere seeker. He was seeking after God. But he had a great virtue, a good virtue. And that virtue is obedience. Look at verse 7. When the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. As you read this chapter, you wonder how everything went for Cornelius. Because when Peter came, Peter was still talking and the Holy Ghost came upon him. And he spoke in tongues with his household. And we know some believers who had been seeking the baptism in the Holy Spirit for years. They have fasted, they have prayed, and yet they have not received the experience. Now, how did Cornelius receive so quickly? Well, you see, the life of Cornelius is a challenging life. And you can see the prompt obedience in this place. Now, think about it. A soldier was the rank of a centurion, a great man, a good man, a prayerful man, but not a Jewish person. Do you know there was a wide gap between the Jewish people and the Gentiles? The rabbis told them that the Gentiles were almost near to dogs. They were not to be reckoned with. And when uh, the angel told Cornelius, you sent to Joppa and you'll call for Simon Peter. He knew that was a Jew, but then he did not have any prejudice within him. And you know too that if you are really going to follow the Lord, all prejudice must be struck off your mind, must be removed from your mind. Even though you are great, you must be humble enough to be obedient to the word of God at the time that you are told. So he sent promptly. And that obedience is what actually helped. And it is what will help every one of us. In Psalm 119, verse 60, I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. Whenever you hear the commandment of God, 
I made haste, delayed not to keep thy commandments. There is blessing in obedience. When we obey, the blessings of God, they overtake us and they overflow in our lives. See how the blessings of God are attached with our obedience. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. You'll be a peculiar people, a peculiar set of people, peculiar treasure unto the Lord above all people if you will obey. If you will obey. The secret of blessing is in obedience. And you check up in your life. When you hear the word of God on a Sunday here, or on a Monday, or on a Thursday, how long does it take you before you obey? Do you have to hear it once again, the second time before you obey? Or hear it for six months, one year before you obey? Or does somebody have to sit down on you and just compel you that, look, you are getting late, you must obey this thing before you eventually sluggishly rise up to obey God? Prompt and willing wholehearted obedience will launch you into the deep blessings of the Lord. Disobedience brings uh, a curse. Obedience brings a blessing. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Verse 1. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, if thou shalt hearken diligently, 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 You know, many young people miss the blessings of the Lord because they don't even listen diligently. They do in church like they do at school. At school, while the teacher is teaching, they might be busy making fun, writing other things that are not notes that the teacher is teaching about. They might be busy just whiling away time or causing trouble. And when they come to church, the same thing they do. And you know, even adults, and especially workers, may be inattentive while the word of God is going on. But there is no way you can obey what you didn't hear. You hear first, then you obey. And it says, If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, they didn't always hear God talking from Mount Sinai, but they heard Moses. While they were listening to Moses, that was God speaking through him because it was not his message. And the same thing when you are listening to the minister of God, it is God talking through the minister because it is the word of God. And if you are hearkening diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God to observe and to do. All his commandments, not the ones you prefer. You know, there are people that saved the word of God and they say, Well, I believe this, I don't believe that. And they're able to select from the Bible what they want to take, and they're able to reject from the Bible what they don't want to take. If you will do and observe all his commandments, which I commanded this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. That's the condition. You obey. Obedience will bring promotion. Obedience will bring prosperity. Obedience will bring the blessings of God in your life. Disobedience will cut the blessings of God away from you. In verse 2, all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. For Samuel chapter 15. 
the Lord had commanded Saul to do something. But then he seemed to be obedient, but in a partial way. Because of all the things he ought to have destroyed, you know what he did? He took some that looked nice to him, good to him, and he refused to destroy everything that ought to have been destroyed. And um, we're told in verse 9, But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and of the lambs, and all that was good and would not destroy, would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me, that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me, and has not performed my commandment. And it grieved Samuel. And he cried unto the Lord all night. The Lord knows your heart. He knows your life. He knows whether you are obedient thoroughly and completely, wholeheartedly and willingly, promptly and exactly as the Lord told you. He knows whether you are keeping back some of the things you should have given up. He knows if there is covetousness in the heart. He knows if there is disobedience running, running within your vein. He knows if, if there is dishonesty in your life. He knows if you are different publicly from when you are in privacy. He knows. And for Saul, the Lord knew that the apparent surface obedience was actually not deep enough. There was disobedience hidden within his actions. And he told Samuel, and he said, I'm so sorry that this man, I wanted to do so much for him and I made him king, but now he has disobeyed me. When Samuel arose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was Saul Samuel saying, Saul came to Carmel and behold, he set up, he set him up a place and he's gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul. And Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. You see hypocrisy? Haven't you done like that before? Haven't you covered your wrong actions, your disobedience, your evil, your backsliding with a loud testimony? Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in my ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Samuel said, They, not I, they have brought them from, Amal from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. You see the excuse? And the rest we have utterly destroyed. Oh, we obeyed God. Only that we spared these ones to sacrifice to the Lord thy God. I do that thing so as to be able to have more money to give to God. What an excuse. God knows your heart. I wear that thing so as to be nice. So that the people will know our God is a God of beauty. What, a, what an excuse. But God knows your heart. And that's what Saul did. That's what Saul said. And then in verse 16, Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And you know, the Lord could say the same thing to us today. Usher, members of the choir, zona leaders, when you are little in thine own sight. When you knew you were small, you knew nothing, easily controlled. When you were little in your sight. 
then God gave you a responsibility and a responsible position in the church. But now, aren't you proud beyond correction? Aren't you so great and so marvelously talented, so wonderfully competent that you feel you know it all and there is no correction that ought to come from any quarter when you are little in your sight? Then the Lord anointed the king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and did evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto, uh, unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites, but the people took of the spoil. You see the excuse again? When people are proud, they never learn to say sorry. They like you to know that they are angels when they are demons. They like you to know that, you know, they are so wise when they are foolish. They like you to know that they are still following the Lord when they are totally backslidden. They will cover it up in action. They will cover it up with a smile. They will cover it up with a testimony. They will cover it up with almost anything. But you know, that doesn't pay us anything at all. Here was a king, you are not a king yet. And if humility was required of a king, humility is required of you. The Lord wants us to be humble whenever you are found to have done something wrong. And to go before the Lord in all humility on your knees and say, Oh Lord, I'm sorry. And whoever you are, a queen or a, or a king, a businessman or a professor from the university, if the word of God says you are wrong, who are you to argue? Oh Lord, I am sorry. And you know, if a Saul had said, I am sorry, maybe the thing would have ended. And then Samuel said in verse 22, As the Lord great delight in burnt offerings, and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord behold to obey is better than sacrifice and to hacking than the fat of rams for rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord he has also rejected thee from being king he lost the throne at that time but even then he could have kept his soul after he lost the throne, listen to me. It is possible to lose the throne and keep the soul. The Lord can rebuke you for something, saying, okay, you will not be king anymore. That's discipline. If you repent just at that time, maybe the Lord will even restore you to be a king. Maybe not. But even if he does not restore you to be a king, you will still keep your soul and go to heaven. If you'll be humble, if you'll be repentant. But you know Saul, he just kept on. He lost not only the throne, he lost his own soul. Right now, he's on the left hand side. Never to see God. Never to be in the presence of God. Never to be in Abraham's bosom. But only to burn in hot hell forever and forever. If you have lost the throne, keep your soul. And that soul is even still greater than the throne. Don't lose everything. Go before the Lord in all humility and know that obedience is very, very important in the sight of the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 23. But this sin commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And walk in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. You want peace? You want health? You want protection? You want all the promises to be yea and amen on your behalf? Obey my voice. And then God says, I will be your God. And you shall be my people. And he says, walk in all the ways. Not only some, walk in all the ways that have commanded you that it may be well with you. In Jeremiah chapter 26, 
บัสชีเดียร์ฟอร์นั่วอามันยูร์วิ่งส์และยูร์ดูอิงส์โอเบย์ดีวอยส์ของพระองค์ยูร์กอร์ดและพระองค์จะรับการยอมรับจากพระองค์ของพระองค์ที่ได้ประกาศให้แก่พวกเขาบอกว่าถ้าพวกเขาได้รับการยอมรับในช่วงนั้นและได้ประกาศให้เขาได้รับการยอมรับในช่วงนั้นและได้ประกาศให้เขาได้รับการยอมรับในช่วงนั้นและได้ประกาศให้เขาได้รับการยอมรับในช่วงนั้นและได้ประกาศให้เขาได้รับการยอมรับในช่วงนั้นและได้ประกาศให้เขาได้รับการยอมรับในช่วงนั้นและได้ประกาศให้เขาได้รับการยอมรับในช่วงนั้นและได้ประกาศให้เขาได้รับการยอมรับในช่วงนั้นและได้ประกาศให้เขาได้รับการยอมรับใน And he went on in disobedience. I hope you don't go on in disobedience. And don't say, "Well, that's a small thing." It's only in the area of um, exaggeration when I talk. Repent of it. Repent of it. It's only in dressing that I don't totally agree with the teaching of the Word of God. Repent of it. It's only in money because you know I can't deceive you. I love money. You do. Repent of it. It's only that I cannot do without a little drinking. Uh, you know, once in a while, and uh, I hear all the other believers saying that uh, you must not at all obey God, obey Him completely and fully. Well, it's only on this uh, women area because uh, the woman issue is sensitive. I like to serve God. Only I, I feel that God should allow me and my three wives to just serve Him. And you know, when I bring all these three wives uh, to the church, we have more members in the church, and they will serve God. God says, "Come with only one, the first one." Well, that's a difficult thing. I really want to serve God, accept the doctrine of the Bible on marriage, obey God, obey God, and it pays to obey God. In the Acts of the Apostles, chapter five, verse thirty-two, and we are His witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey Him. You want the Holy Ghost? Then obey God. His convicting power will work in your life when you obey the little light you have. He will be a witness of your spirit that you are a child of God when you are obedient to the light you have received. He will bring about the holy life within you because He is a Holy Spirit when you obey the light you have got. And if you have been sanctified, and you are seeking for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. When you obey God, when you obey God, when you obey, He will give you what you are seeking for. When you disobey God, the Holy Spirit withdraws. When you obey, He comes nearer. Now we can see that Cornelius obeyed, and it was a prompt obedience. Now we look at verse nine of Acts, chapter ten, verse nine. On the morrow. As they went on their journey, and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the house top to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry, and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance, and saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet neat at the four corners, and let down to the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, "Rise, Peter, kill and eat." But Peter said, "Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean." The voice spake unto him again the second time, "What God has cleansed, that call not thou common." This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now Peter received a vision, a vision from the Spirit of God. Now you can see here, the Lord had settled on Cornelius' side. Cornelius had seen. That he ought to send to Peter, living in the house of Simon Etana in Joppa, and he had already sent the people. And Peter went up to the house top, not to play, but to pray. Not to play, 
but to pray. Have you ever seen some people when they're seeking the baptism in the Holy Spirit, they pray, they pray, they pray. They will not jest. They're serious. They read the Bible. They're searching. They're learning about faith. They are fasting. On Thursday, they are coming. And uh, if there is any opportunity to gather together with other believers uh, for prayer, they pray. They're seeking for the Holy Ghost baptism. They're very zealous about it. Eventually, they receive. After they have received, oh, thank God. I don't have to pray too much now. I've got what I want. I don't have to pray as much as I was praying before. After all, I now have the Holy Ghost. What remains? Only to play. And he'll be telling the other people, ah, you better go and pray. I have done my own praying. I've got what I wanted. Now I can play all I like because the Holy Ghost is there. But you know the apostle, he continued to pray even much more than ever before. Some people feel that it's only before you receive the Holy Ghost that you tarry. You better continue to tarry after you have got the Holy Ghost. Some people feel that it's before you get the gifts of the Spirit, you tarry, you wait upon the Lord. You better continue to tarry and to wait upon the Lord. Even after you have got the gifts of the Holy Ghost so that you can develop. So that you can develop because otherwise if you have got something and you don't uh, develop you'll know that uh, you will be losing that power and the presence and the use of the gifts so he went up and he went to pray he became very hungry and he would have eaten and at that time he fell into a trance about meat about eating do you understand that he was hungry, he was hungry, and God showed him a trance about what to eat. You know, some people will dismiss that and they will say, well, it was because I was hungry. Young lady, all of a sudden you were feeling the desire to get married. And the desire was very deep in you. And then you went to pray. You were not praying on the marriage. You just knew there was a burning desire. It looks like, I think I'm now of age to get married. And then a revelation comes. And uh, one lady or sister will counsel you and say, Well, don't take that revelation. It was because you were thinking in that direction. Peter was thinking about food. He actually wanted to eat. And Peter was wondering, ah, when are they going to finish the food? They are getting late today. And then the trance came about eating meat. There are ways God works. God had worked on the side of Cornelius. And just before Cornelius came to the door, the Lord now was working on Peter. You know, it's many times like that in marriage. When you are really depending upon the Lord, the Lord has spoken to a brother. And it is so very clear. And now, while he is making preparation to come, just before he comes, if that sister is actually the will of God, and if that sister is actually prayerful herself, the Lord will be showing her. But at the first revelation of that brother, or of that thing to do, you may not completely understand. You may not completely agree. Because when the Lord said now, Rise, Peter, kill and eat, Peter said, Not so, my Lord. And it is possible when the Lord is revealing his mind to you, you may say, not so, my Lord. Because you have never, uh, you have never eaten anything common or unclean. In our family, I have never seen a Yoruba man marrying an ethnic person. Well, but revelation has come. And so you see, while Peter was doubting, this was a vision from above. And as the vision came again, this was word of knowledge. Look at it from verse 17 now. He did not understand the vision, therefore the Holy Ghost now spoke. My sheep hear my voice. We now see the voice of the shepherd now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Again, let me remind you, 
about the word of knowledge. Somebody could have come from the house and go, could have gone upstairs to the place where Peter was and he could have said exactly the same thing. Behold, three men, uh, three men are seeking for you. If somebody came from the ground floor and climbed up the stairs and went to Peter to tell him that three people are looking for you, that is knowledge, that is ordinary knowledge. But nobody came. The Spirit of God from above gave him that knowledge, earthly knowledge, about three men which were, that were looking for Peter because the knowledge came from above and he knew it without a human being on earth telling him. That is why you call it a word of knowledge. And it says in verse 20, Arise therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Isn't that what happens when a sister has been praying, and um, somebody has come? And while the sister is doubting, if that sister is actually looking up to the Lord, if she is not looking for money, if she's not looking for a better person, if she's not looking for an educated person, if she's not looking for, well, a Yoruba man like myself, an Igbo uh, man like myself, if uh, she's actually waiting upon the Lord, the Lord will see and she will know it. Get it down. Go with them. Doubting nothing. I have sent them. In John chapter 10, verse 3 to verse 5, to him the potter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. For they know his voice. A stranger will they not follow, but they will flee from him. For they know not the voice of strangers. In verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And um, Peter followed them. And the result of following them, what happened when he got there, we shall see next Monday by the grace of God. But what the Lord has taught us today, remember, however good or great we are, we need still the help of God, the power of God. We need to be prayerful. And um, whatever visions or revelations we have seen before, the Lord is still directing us to get to the church, listen to the word of God from the ministers. And whatever we learn, let us be humble enough to be obedient to the Lord. Rise up and let us pray. See what the Lord has taught us. If you are great, be good at the same time. Even if you are high in the world, look up to the higher God. Don't let all your confidence be in your position or in your rank. Look up to God. And remember, church member, when you were little in your own sight, the Lord drew you nearer, lifted you up to the position in which you are now, remain humble. When you are done wrong and you are corrected, be humble, be obedient. Brother, sister, if God is showing you something on marriage, make sure it's the Lord and follow what the Lord is saying in the proper way. After you have been saved, you need to keep on praying. After you have been sanctified, you need to keep on praying. After you have been baptized in the Holy Ghost, you need to keep on praying. If you pray as much after as you prayed before, you won't easily get into trouble. Think of areas in which God has been calling you to obey. The area of the use of your tongue. Have you obeyed? In the area.